the first and the last three events that we had this semester. Uh, the next event will be here in two days, uh, and I'm delighted to see our guest speaker in the audience today, Evgeny Steiner. Uh, and the last event this semester will, will be on December 10th, next Tuesday, uh, at the Henry Miller Center, and it's going to be a film screening of a remarkable film, Van Gogh, called Van Gogh's, uh, which has very little to do with the artist. Uh, but we will be joined with the film director, uh, Sergei Livnev, <coughs> for the questions. Uh, so please come to, uh, to these two events that are following this program. Uh, today, our guest is Katya Margolis, who many of you know, uh, but let me still introduce her very briefly and her talk will speak for itself and for uh, Katya's geographical whereabouts. So Katya comes from Venice, where she lives and works. Uh, she's an artist, uh, she's also a literary uh, writer, I should say. Uh, she has also worked with children uh, with health conditions and taught them to draw and this is a very large part of her um, of her life I should say. Uh, today Kathy will talk about her not native city but the city that she has known uh, very very well uh, including its most recent uh, kind of occurring uh, natural developments, not to say disasters, the flood that Venice is still recovering from, uh, and has been recovering from uh, for a number of centuries. <laughs> so uh, if you want to so ask anything successful. about this. Sorry. Quite successfully. Quite right. successfully, yes. And the, this makes Venice uh, kind of very different from the traditional representations of natural disasters, such as floods in Russian literature. Uh, we have had the bronze horseman this semester, so this is going to be quite different in its representation. Uh, and not to mention this day. So the topic of Kanye's talk is Venice unread, uh, which is something that uh, intrigues us uh, precisely because of the, of, of the second part, of the unread part. Uh, and you will hear what it is about in a second from Katya herself, but Venice has, of course, traditionally been depicted in art, in literature, uh, perhaps more than any other uh, European city. Uh, at the same time, it's never read entirely, so perhaps this is uh, a good point to, uh, to turn it over to Katya to hear more about how it's read and unread at the same time. Thank you so much for it. Thank you. Thank you. Please go. So, uh, first point I want to make, I will not talk about aquat and disaster. That's the topic of my next talk. It will be a, a fifth of the people that comes from the Adams State, or whatever it is. Uh, and that will be particularly the topic of the next meeting. Uh, Aquat is a cultural metaphor, so I'll try to avoid as much as possible this talk today and we'll talk about other things, but I'm actually open to answer any questions and <laughs> later on. That's, the, that's become a hot topic or a wet topic over the last <laughs> Maybe um, microphone. Sorry. Microphone, did you microphone? We don't I can speak louder. Oh, no. No. Yeah? Is it all right? Don't move closer. There are still more seats here. Is it all right right now? I do need a microphone. I do need a microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to speak as loud as I can. Yash, can you tell me where to speak? Let's move closer and it will be more audible. Yeah, that's right. Because the message is so good. Personal 
But once I walked along these fundamental, which is fundamental del Zatare, raft embankment, uh, with my shopping cart full of shopping, of course, I would, uh, as always in Venice, any season and any time of the day, it was full of tourists running to for sightseeing and trying to fit all the possible and impossible cultural uh, beauties and attractions in the agenda. And as, I, as, the, as they overpassed me, I heard uh, people speaking English, Russian, French. Actually, over the years I spent a day, I noticed that the languages can come by waves. There's a period when you see, when you hear English all the time. When it's at carnival time, you just you feel you're in a French city. You uh, hear French all the time. Uh, there are some English people, German, Russian, of course. Uh, so there were people, there were English people, English-speaking people, and Russian-speaking tourists running along the same embankment, uh, but uh, attracted to two different things. While all English-speaking floor stopped at this nice Pensione Calcina, if you imagine I'll show the map of the Venice later, they would stop there and admire this uh, place where the great hero and the major figure of English literature, art, art critics, and everything uh, of the predecessor of arts and craft movement, uh, John Ruskin State, and it's put in a tale in a very pompous way, such a dote de arte, priest of art, nelle nostre pietre, nel nostro San Marco, quasi in ogni momento di uh, Italia, e c'è con insieme l'animo del artificio e l'animo del popolo, who serves in every evening, our San Marco, in the stones of our San Marco, and in every monument of Italy, I was looking for the handmade soul and so of the people. Yes. Uh, so while all the English-speaking floor stopped by this consumer and tried to read this description and try to stop here and brush it away uh, in memory of John Ruskin, uh, the Russian floor passed by without paying any attention to it at all. Because the Russian, the more the Russian, we will talk about this later, were attracted to a different love, which is few, which is few feet away, and it is Joseph Brodsky, who is the Venice itself for more than Russian reading and Russian speaking people. And again, uh, this is the century being Italian. Brodsky was a grande poeta russo, premio Nobel Amore con to questo logo. Joseph Brodsky, big Russian, great Russian poet, uh, Nobel Prize winner, loved and sang this place. While for the Russian speaking audience, I know there are some people here who don't read Russian, uh, but I'll make a small, just a very small reading. A riddle for a Russian speaker. There is a, there is a big, there is a mistake in the Russian inscription. There is a mistake. Uh, well, if you like, if the someone doesn't even see it, yeah. it says, it says, I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read it in Russian. Иосиф Бродский, великий русский поэт, лауреат Нобелевской премии, воспел набережную Нестери. Russian 
stayed, stayed here on this Fundamenta de Incurabili, where this, the famous hospital of the incurable used to be uh, Academia de Belle Arte, the Academy of uh, Arts, is now. Actually, uh, Brodsky, when he was uh, doing his uh, book, preparing his commissioned work, it was a commission work by uh, uh, an organization, Venetian organizations, and the English title, as we all know, is Watermark, while the translator, Grigory Dashevsky, preferred to change it in Russian for the Italian title, Fundamenta de Incurabili, the Invention of the Incurable. Uh, the incurable meaning there was this hospital of the incurable people, but also uh, it meant, of course, people ill by Venice who can't be cured from Venice, from this love, from this attraction, from this rejection, because Venice has always been the great topic for metaphor for Russian and for English speaking and for French and for German and so on. So that's what we're going to talk about. Mm. So looking at this map of Venice, in Italy, uh, it is uh, Venice, some people see a fish here, some people see two hands. When little children are taught how to find their way in Venice, they are taught like this. That two hands, this is the Grand Canal, and here's San Marco. And how, that's how children learn their way uh, in Venice. Uh, actually, if we now, if we think of this map of Venice as a cultural plan, plan like mental map in a way, I was trying after uh, making this observation of people being attracted to different cultural places. Uh, according to what, actually, it's according to what language they came with. Because we come to a place with a certain language, not only uh, physical language, but mostly mental language. Literature that we read, uh, pictures that we saw, stories that we were told, etc. Especially, especially literature. Uh, so when we see things for the first time, especially uh, so hard to burden things with cultural meanings and metaphors and things like, like Venice. Actually, what we do, in a way, we compare the picture, the preconceived picture of what we have already, of what we read, of the Sony cinema, of the photographs, and everything that we've been told before, with what we actually see. It, and trying to find signs of this, like le on the landmarks, this real landscape, we are trying to find these cultural landmarks. Uh, in a way, uh, what, what we see is what we've read, in a way. And uh, the itineraries we make, of course, Venice is made in such a way to be lost. Uh, and everyone who's been to Venice once or twice or twice, they lose this experience of being lost. In Venice. Uh, so uh, next, so if we look at the uh, map of Venice as a text, the landscape as a text, and here I just put my my own artwork, of trying to interpret the actual landscape with the watercolor, and then the text, uh, the, it's a poem by Montale. Uh, what we see is. Uh, what, uh, how we wander across the city is similar how we look at things. There is a famous experiment, most of you probably know about it, of Yarmos in 67, about the eye movements. He was the first one to study uh, how people look, at, especially at artwork. Uh, what, we, what we see how do we see, uh, how do we look at things? How do we look at, for example, this profile? We're looking for, there are a few ways of looking at things. And the, uh, first of all, it, it's a cognitive way. What is important for us as human beings? The expression, eyes, lips. And you can see what he's done. There was no technology at that time, of course. What he's done, he would kind of little mirrors to 
the eyes of people, and then there was the fruit of paper, left uh, traces with light as people moved their eyes. And he was trying to trace, to trace the eye movements of uh, different people looking at the same work of art. And here are these kids. But what interests us here is not just the so-called cognitive way of looking at things, like the eyes, the lips, the, uh, but also the, the cultural way of looking at things. There's this famous painting, he studied this famous painting by the other and there's nothing to do with this, but it's actually Nizdali, uh, uh, where uh, he studied how people looked at this painting. And they're examining the picture, it's an unexpected visitor, it's called in English, with uh, these schemes refer to looking at the same paintings with different questions in mind. Uh, actually, the number A is a free examination. What people look at when they just look at this painting? Uh, but they see the key figures, the composition is made in such a way the people from the main figure to the to this woman going moving towards him, and then the children and uh, but what is more interesting, for instance, B. For instance, B is a question is a uh, visual answer to a question. And the question was uh, estimate the material circumstances of the family <coughs> in the future. So when being asked a question. Uh, we start to look at different details. So here people are looking, when if in pre-examination we look at the people and the relationship with, the, with this question about the material circumstances of the financial well-being of the fellow, uh, people start to look at furniture, at thing, things at the wall, etc., etc. Uh, there are other questions like, uh, give, the ages, give the ages of the people. So people start to scan <coughs> every figure separately. Or the uh, surveys what the family has been doing before the arrival of an expected visitor. E, remember the, remember the clothes of the people. So here the faces become less important. Uh, people are trying to scan the, uh, the clothes. Remember the position of the people and the objects in the room. And and this is the most interesting thing, actually, it's less material, less estimate how long the unexpected visitor has been away from the family. And here people try to visually study the relationship, the relationship. They're trying to evaluate things that are hard are harder to be perceived at the first at the first glance. And then when people actually being asked a question, people start to look at things differently. And it's a quite an obvious point, uh, but it is not as obvious as uh, we, uh, we think. Actually, so, uh, actually, the traditional study, now we are moving to the landscape, moving to the Venetian landscape, which I actually introduced the same kind of idea. I just put, I just put few casual tourists itineraries on the map. It doesn't matter. San Marco, or Zatri, or Puzza della Dordana, people know many as they can see it. Here, for instance, here, we see uh, this embankment of the Curabili. But actually, if we look at the itineraries on the map, on the culture of map of Venice, uh, it can be compared with the same kind of experiment. When people left on their own, their own they just wander around, they, uh, they still have some main cultural point. They know that Venice is San Marco, Rialto, anyone knows it. It doesn't matter whether an English-speaking person or a French-speaking person or a Russian-speaking person. Everyone would go to San Marco, everyone would go to Rialto. And then uh, flows start to deviate. Some people uh, will go around the Ponte de Suspiri, for instance, the Bridge of Sighs will return. It was uh, first, first de described 
it is a major point in our mentality department that is so spirit that uh, a little bridge that links together uh, uh, the Dodgers Palace and the famous prison, Pyongyi. Uh, and we think of it as an obvious uh, landscape mark of Venice, but it was actually first noted by Lord Byron, and then I'll show the cultural itinerary how it came to our mentality, uh, to Russian culture, to uh, French culture, to German culture, and there are a few other, a few other things. So actually, when I and when just talking to friends who came visiting, one said a lot of people asked me, a lot of English speaking people asked me about uh, Pension Ruskin. I never heard the question about Ruskin from a Russian speaking audience, uh, which uh, makes it quite different um, from the pre revolutionary state of things, and I'll mention that slide later. Now, uh, actually, the, uh, if we think now of this Venetian map, Venetian landscape, the mental map of Venice, let's think of uh, Venice as a kind of the mental cultural map of our brain when we come to visit. Uh, if we think about this, we can imagine now, we can imagine landscape and landscape has been, since the semiotic theory evolved, has been largely analyzed as a text, and the cultural text, and the readings, and then the idea and the concept of uh, landscape as text uh, evolved and evaluated and uh, changed as the whole semiotic <coughs> theory changed, and it is more, uh, now it is more seen as an open possibility of interpretations by not only the writer's intentions, but also it now includes uh, the, all, the all the possibilities of arbitrary interpretations by readers. Or, if we project the same idea to this or to the map, it, uh, it means that we all, when we come, we come with a certain, uh, to read a certain text and pass by certain itineraries, but of course our interpretations our uh, ideas, our writings, our writings of what has been already read, written about Venice contributes to this, uh, to the text. Um, so, this is the text, the landscape. <laughs> uh, this is the actual text, has uh, traveling, reading and writing have been, of course, closely related since the very, very, very early origin of writing itself. And that's the famous, uh, the ancient way of writing, what it's called, was the course of freedom, which is, which relates to the idea of the ox plowing the field. Mm -hmm. And when the ox it goes like this. Yeah? We need to plow a field, to plant a field, you go like this. And that's where the Greeks, in some Greek inscription, they used the same kind of, uh, of bustrophedonic writing. Actually, if you read it, so it looks were written half right side up and up, half upside down, all the Greek would be twice as fast, and the eye would be less likely to lose its spot moving from one line to the next. You can see that by the third line, you're quite used to this to this kind of writing. So the idea of writing and reading, it's not, there's not, nothing new about it, is very much related to the idea of traveling, of seeing things. So that's, uh, and we do more or less the same thing as we, do, as we walk across the city, we do the same thing, we walk across the text and we visualize things. Uh, and uh, this is the very uh, early, actually, landscape uh, as an early example of the mission painting of the landscape, which is in the which is here in the position of some large square. And here we can see that actually, here visually, he is trying to introduce the text of the uh, events of the government, of the uh, uh, procession 
that took place about 40 years before the painting, this uh, work was painted. And it is the first depiction of San Mark Square. But San, uh, the idea is that, uh, that uh, people, people here uh, made the into processions and from there, from how they're dressed and how they're put on a landscape, one can draw, I will not stop on that, a lot of conclusion about this structure, not only the structure of the visual landscape, but the structure of the Venetian society, which was, and uh, of the Venetian uh, ways of doing things, of introducing uh, the order of things in Venice, and uh, as well as similar painting by Lorenz City about Siena's good government, you know, this fresco uh, shows that the way good government put things on their places. So it, in a way it's a visualized the concept of the uh, city structure and the hierarchic <coughs> structure of the society. So now we we'll pass to, to our friend Lula Polyla, who was the first key I student in Venice in the Bridge of Science and Helen in the prison in each end is the first counter of the child Harold pilgrimage. And as we know, Byron lived in Venice and been in Venice many times, and he also, also is famous for his famous swim from the main main island Venice to Lindo, which is quite a long way. Mm -hmm. If anyone tried it, it's about <laughs> 20 minutes of a plateau. Uh, but it was the most, the quotation index of these lines in the mid uh, 19th century probably was the highest uh, uh, of any quotation of, about Venice in the whole history of literature. He influenced every writer in English, or Russian, or French, uh, or French literature on Venice. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as I already mentioned, here's, here's the place where he stayed. And again, it's this, it's his room. As I already mentioned, he was, uh, that was his romantic view of a man who delusion with everything, finding him inside the society separate from it, uh, which later, of course, in Russian literature influenced greatly Pushkin and many other, Lermontov and many other 19th century writers. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, what is interesting about Byron is also that the work is quite witty, I wrote other ironic paper, rather ironic texts about this that never uh, entered the corpus of our ideas about Venice. While well, his description uh, in the fourth comes of the uh, which of Child Herald became uh, the iconic the iconic, uh, the iconic verse of, uh, I'll just read the first, the beginning. I stood in Venice on the bridge of size, a palace and a prison in each hand. I saw from out the wave her structures rise, and from this stroke, as this stroke of the enchanter's wave. A thousand years, the cloudy wings expand around me, and a dying glory smiles, where you for the far times, when many a subject land looked to the wind blind marble piles where Venice sate in state drawn on her hundred isles. Uh, oh, okay, I'll, uh, this is it. And the next the next uh, English author, English speaking author, which we do not connect at all in Venice, at least the Russian speakers, is Dickens. Dickens was a major, ma uh, major poet, I would say, of the writing prose of Venice. Uh, and 
she was actually unlike Byron and Ruskin, I'll talk about Ruskin slightly later. He was the first one to talk about Venice, not as in an encyclopedic way, describing monuments and things and separate attractions, but he started, he started the whole tradition of, uh, of per very personal Venice. Uh, he uh, actually his famous uh, writing the pictures from Italy. Dickens spent few years, I think five years in Italy. He was based mostly in Genoa, but he came to Venice quite often. And unlike other uh, other little uh, chapters in this book, in this book, uh, the first pictures from Italy, uh, his chapter uh, number seven about Venice differs dramatically from all other descriptions of our, all other uh, Italian towns and cities. Which is, uh, it's just just normal structure of his chapter, if you haven't read it, if you haven't read it, it's just little snapshots of local life, observation of Italian customs, uh, uh, some small remarks. Uh, and basically it's a travelogue aimed for a quite middle class armchair reader at the fireplace remembering or imagining his trip to uh, Italy. Quite a classical uh, genre, genre for 19th century. But what happens uh, in chapter 7 in Venice is that quite a break away from this formula. He knows uh, <coughs> that the expectations to write about Venice is very high, are very high already. At least he was trying to do a different thing. He's trying to um, he's trying to describe his whole Venetian experience as a dream. He is expecting to come to Venice, he's dozing on a coach, on a train, and he has this dream, and in, in this dream I will not uh, he puts bits and pieces of his real Venetian experience, but they are all woven into his dream. Uh, it's a kind of coastal city, sitting on water that appears and disappears. And I really, really recommend everyone who loves Venice, or doesn't love Venice, but doesn't know Venice to write, because it's a, absolutely, especially for Russian readers and Russian Dickens, the big thing in Russian literature and Russian tradition as well. And it's a quite unexpected way of uh, looking at things. I will even cite a small thing. All that I had heard of it, wrote of it in truth of fiction, fancied of it, is left thousands of miles behind. You know that I am liable to disappoint in such things from over expectation. But Venice is above, beyond, and out of all reach of coming near the imagination of man. It, is, it has never been rated high enough, right? He, it's uh, his letter, it's his first letter, 44. Uh, and then he says, um, it is beyond all pen and all pencil. I know that I never saw the thing before I think I should be afraid to describe. But to tell that Venice is, I feel to be an impossibility. Uh, and then um, he, he writes, uh, unsubstantial magic of the time, and diving again into vast churches and old tombs, a new sensation, a new memory, a new mind come, uh, came upon me. Venice is a bit of my brain of this time. So this uh, changing, mind changing, Venice being a commonplace, and at the same time being something totally new, uh, became a new tradition of writing about Venice. Uh, and Dickens is the first one to initiate that, and this tradition is especially is especially strong in Russian literature, in Russian Venetian, Russian <coughs> writings about Venice, starting from Pushkin, moving on uh, to uh, like dozens and hundreds of, po especially poetry. Now I uh, just now feel the big anthology made by. Timinchik and Soborov, it's about a thousand page volume, 
of Russian Veneziana starting from the 18th century and ending in 1972 is the date of publication of the first poem on Venice by Joseph Brodsky, which marked another era in, the, uh, in describing Venice according to this anthology. And another, another thing I would recommend is this brilliant uh, anthology by John Julius Norwich, who is the greatest historian and writer about Venice. It's called A, Travel A Traveler's Reader. And it contains all various bits and pieces of writing of traveling writers by English speaking and not only English speaking, but mostly English speaking people to Venice dating from the 14th, 14th century to our days. And it, can, it has Dickens and it has uh, you know, Legends of Byron and Mark Twain uh, comparing who hated. Venice it was quite delusional and compared San Mark, uh, San Basilica de San Marco to the big cockroach, very ugly on these fat columns crawling slowly across the piazza. <laughs> uh, so there are people who love Venice and who hate Venice, but it's a very, very um, thrilling, really, I would say. Uh, but moving back to this English uh, tradition, we come to John Ruskin and his famous Stones of Venice. Uh, as we, uh, I won't stop the at all, uh, but uh, again, I uh, read a short entry from his diary when he first came to Venice. Uh, Thank God I'm here. In the, it is the paradise of cities, and there is a moon enough to make half the centuries of the Earth's lunatic, striking a pure flashes of light against the gray water before the moon there. And I'm happier than I have been in these five years, so happy. Happier than the inner probability I ever shall be again in my life. That's what a 22-year-old Ruskin writes in his diary, and he, of course, became a great part of the mission story, not only in describing it, in looking at it, but also a big contribution, to, uh, made a big contribution, but this volume made a big contribution to the conservation of monuments, to the depiction of various small details of uh, the uh, whole, uh, it's kind of encyclopedic, uh, tutorial and also verbal volumes uh, that were aimed to save, in his, as in his idea, the dying Venice of this time, to preserve it from disappearing and help people restore it. And uh, here are a few. He spent a long deal depicting, and it was mainly a Gothic city, and it is a very important point for Ruskin, obviously, the Gothic is a craftsman, and reality and worshipping uh, is uh, kind of ideal, ideal predecessor city being the predecessor of the arts and crafts movement. He worshipped Venice especially as a Gothic city and that's one of the reasons he hated so much Palladio and all the Palladian introduction to Venice because he thought it was a counter, Gothic counter, uh, counter aesthetic towards here. Uh, wanted Venice to be, and it was, a, and again, being very encyclopedic, being very precise, in detail, uh, being, being very faithful to every on uh, or column, he sees Venice as an ideal city to which his ideas are projected. His ideas as thinker, his ideas as art critic, and as a, his philosophical idea. So in a, in a way, being, as we see, from um, many examples, being a very s strongly burdened place by a uh, cultural burdened place. At the same time, Venice, in a strange way, becomes an ideal place, kind of tabula rasa, why she a thing for one's own projections. Everyone has, in Broski wrote later, everyone has uh, the, his own ideas 
on Venice and interested in Venice. Interest not only in the material sense, but also in... Uh, so everyone sees what he want, she or she wants to see in Venice. Uh, and here I just put two examples of... Uh, uh, this is the famous Bloody Redentory Church that uh, Ruskin dedicated by this prize in pages to. And this is a, a new Gothic that's the outer market, fish market, in the 19th later, 19th century building, that is very much in the spirit of the Gothic menace that uh, Ruskin would have approved, but he didn't have an opportunity to see it was built later. Uh, but uh, again, even looking at the further development, we can project his ideas, Ruskin's ideas, on the contemporary uh, landscape of Venice and see Venice through Ruskin's eyes. Now, uh, getting to the Russian Venice, you know, I want to start, uh, again, Ruskin was widely read and read and, read and very well known by Russian writers in, in the Russian tradition. Well, no, and it's uh, completely the same uh, is about Byron and about slightly less Dickens, although Dickens, uh, probably Little Dorrit, was uh, quite a famous novel in Russian. And as we know, part of the plot is that when the family is re released from the death prison, they travel to Venice, and the little girl, Amy, who has never seen anything by that prison in her life, the first thing, actually the first thing she sees in, in life is Venice. So she, uh, the juxtaposition of her images of her childhood in prison is al alternate with, uh, with this sight of Venice and she compares it with the prison impression all the time. If you really read the station, this is a kind of flashback. She looks at the Grand, this Palazzo Grand Canal and thinks, oh, that's so much, this room is so much bigger than our cell in martial arts in the prison. Uh, but the interesting thing uh, about this, and uh, that in this description of Venice uh, as a flashback to something else, it is a very much a Proustian thing, and Proustian with another big name in Venice depiction, and another itinerary in the floor, in the tourist floor, because for instance, all French go to uh, Palazzo Pontarini Pugnac, it's a uh, Renaissance, beautiful Renaissance palazzo near uh, the Academia Bridge, uh, where Marcel Proust and his friend Leonardo Arn stayed many times. It has a long history, which uh, was brought by uh, Vinaretta Zinger, who was the daughter of the inventor of the sewing machine, as you see. Uh, and uh, she bought it for her husband, Bon de Polignac. Uh, they were both gay people, they were happily married to each other and uh, at home died very young and she being a rich woman, really, she wanted to please at home. So she bought, it was once they were staying in Palazzo Barbaro, which is another famous palace related to Venice and related to Henry James and the Curtis family and this way related to New York, uh, where they stayed once and the mom said what a beautiful Renaissance palace we have in front of us and that's how we already decided to make this little present. So anyway, this became a place of uh, visits of many important French figures and Proust stayed there many times and Proust and his Albertine Desparu uh, again used this technique of flashbacks of Combré and Venice, Combré and Venice a kind of really cinematic technique of uh, de uh, depicting Venice by depicting something else. Yeah. So, uh, well, I probably have to bypass Turner, which is another visual tradition quite parallel, quite parallel uh, to, to the uh, Ruskin and English literature itinerary, well, of course we know that Turner was a major 
failing to arrange your artist to destroy looted Venice, and but his attraction to Venice started again with Byron, with literature. Before he this is a kind of famous painting, uh, Child Girls Pilgrimage. So when he first started to depict Venice, he started with literary, literary prayers with Shylock, with Juliet, and then on the later on, Venice overcame, in a way overcame his preconceptions, his literary preconceptions, and uh, that's how Venetian turning became what he became. I already mentioned Henry James, and Henry James, just a small thing, Henry James uh, continued the same tradition, uh, but Venice being quite ironic in his, in his writing about Venice, and it's to his, uh, he once said that the most interesting thing you can say about Venice is that there is nothing new, new you can say about Venice. Uh, <laughs> And which later was uh, analyzed by many people, and especially uh, now the present contemporary Venice based poets and Venice based writers that I know, for instance, and there are a lot of various cultures and languages, uh, they try, they almost never write about Venice as Venice. They avoid this topic, but that's a but that's appreciating, uh, because for them, Venice is a place inspiration place for to me, but not the subject of their, of their writing. You can write. Uh, but uh, J Henry James uh, writes about very deep, close, personal connection, and he's, he sees Venice with a, uh, in, a, in a romantic kind of uh, relationship with a woman. You can see this uh, here also. <coughs> and uh, on, in Russian Venice, uh, there are non-Russian speaking people here. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's a long, long, long tradition. And what is interesting that before the revolution, this tradition is very much linked to the English tradition, especially English. There, of course, to the Gautier, to Amélie Lomelier, but it is mostly, it is mostly uh, English. Russian Venice and English Venice are very much the same. Uh, Modestan gives uh, a little, Modestan gives a little different Venice, and he starts, or well, not starts, but continues the line of death in Venice, and Venice, uh, Venice as death, uh, and you know, I think all Russian speaking people know this point, so I invite English speaking people to write it. Uh, uh, I'll just say a small thing. Uh, maybe, um, <coughs> Венецейская жизнь мрачная и бесплодная, для меня значение светло, заглядится в лесную холодную, голубое, грязное стекло. И тогда тяжелые твои Венеции у горы, и Борис на храмах зеркала, воздух твой граненый, спальня твоя горы, голубого, грязного стекла. Thy air has faces in the bedroom, so mountains of blue, uh, blue deflected glass. And here again we see uh, the juxtaposition because of course glass is glass, mirror, water, all these metaphors are very at death, a vanity, and a lot, a long, long, long line of various of metaphors that grow through, especially the Russian literature about this. But uh, an interesting thing about that, that many Spanish time, according to most, but it has never been to Venice. Although some people claim, uh, based on these two lines, they are expressed in the way that so mountains of blue, the perfect glass. It's quite enigmatic in a way. Uh, but people who have been, have been actually to Venice can see that in the uh, clear winter days, 
one can see the Dolomite Mountains in the background. It is blue, they are blue, uh, and they look like glass. And actually, when you open the window, the northern side uh, of Venice, if you stand for the Mentinova, you can see those mountains, the reflection of those mountains in your window, which very much corresponds to the description. And there is actually uh, one article on some colleague from uh, Jerusalem, I think, University of Hope, Basing on this, I <coughs> claims that Mangerstam had actually been to Venice because it is impossible to imagine this kind of image without actually seeing it. It's quite technical description in a way. Uh, well, another example, and he makes reference to Tintoret and Susanna, and the elder, the thinking Venice, Venice had a lot, Venice's beauty. Uh, which later we can see in Brodsky, uh, he also cited the same uh, Susanna and the Elders. And it has also prevalence because Dodges of Venice were elected after the age of 70, uh, and Venice is being always young and beautiful, and Elders looking after them, not, all, not always with good intentions. <laughs> And uh, another thing about uh, this, this poem is that it refers uh, to, of course, to San Marco Mosaics, uh, and uh, it, has, it has a direct reference. Igorat, Igorat, Kazina, Sviches, Lone Road, Dritio, Kapche, and candles burning, burning in the baskets, like the door flowed back into the ark. I will leave apart, as I said, the idea of the art, of the flood, of the aqua and all the metaphors that go with it. And, uh, uh, and just also, uh, switch to another quite iconic Russian poem about Venice by Pasternak, who, strangely enough, continues not the English but the German tradition, because the German tradition of Venice is not the, an acoustic one, a sonoric one. Goethe wrote, wrote about gondoliers singing and uh, the whole passages of journey to Italy uh, dedicated to Venice about the songs and music and the acoustics. And also, interesting enough, uh, Wagner, of course, read Goethe. Um, uh, also writes about uh, his impressions, his first impressions about Venice, hearing the cry of the gondola. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, actually, when gondolas turn the corners, as there are no lights and no signals, in order to avoid accident, there's a special, that I can't call it special, uh, that I can't um, probably reproduce. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in this way, they tell that the gondola is going around the corner that the <coughs> is coming. So this OA cadenza was used by Wagner in his Tristan and his own the thing. Uh, and Pasternak here uh, describes Venice through a choir that he hears in the morning and knowing uh, Pasternak's fascination and inclinations towards German philosophy and what it was actually his main topic and why we know we can uh, see the German the German one in this cultural itinerary. I will um and here we come to Joseph Brodsky, the landmark uh, for most Russians. Uh, now Russians who come to Venice, they torture Venetians, they only figure where's the fundamental of Emperor and where's the tomb of Joseph Brodsky, San Michele. Uh, and Venetians, some Venetians are quite pleased with it, some Venetians are quite annoyed by it, uh, because worshipping, and, and I was one of these neophytes when I came to Venice, uh, uh, they make the point of that Venice is, Venice is such a special place that just no matter, Joseph Brodsky, Wallace O'Byron, 
or Wagner, or Goethe, or whom we all must was is just one of our priests, while Venice itself is the god, the temple, the place. Uh, and therefore, they're trying to diminish, to diminish the associated of every tourist floor. They're quite pleased. Or like a lot of a lot of good people wrote about all this, yes. Uh, I will not uh, stop it long in general course because it is a topic but in itself. Uh, what is interesting are the small artifacts that are uh, that appear in watermark and later on is the same artifact that appear in Goethe's journey to Italy, when people see small things from Venice in Murano glass vase or a small gondola or a photograph that come from Venice before they actually go to Venice. It's kind of small childhood memory of something they haven't actually seen. <coughs> and coming with a small memory, this project they project the small memory on the big uh, big city on the big cultural myth. And what we have as a result of it, if we try to, and I hope it will be done, if we map all these cultural intersecting itineraries on the map of Venice <coughs> and cover different floors of uh, nationality, national writing and uh, paintings to different times, 19th century and 20th century, what we get is the complicated palimpsest picture, palimpsest being a text over it in a half erased text over it in another text, and Venice itself is a cultural uh, place, the mental map or the cultural map appears to be such a palimpsest uh, <coughs> where everyone wanders uh, and moves from one layer to another layer according to one's cultural tradition, to one's reading, and to one's uh, <coughs> expectations. And the, la the last thing I would probably want to mention, uh, as I already cited uh, Henry James, where there is nothing, the, main, the new thing about Venice, but there is nothing new that can be said about Venice. Venice uh, is full, of course, is full of discoveries and both from semiotic point of view, when every interpretation contributes to the text, even visually, there have been quite a lot of very important discoveries of matching missing pieces to get any kind of <coughs> mosaics, like in San Marco, you see the little uh, tiles uh, or top cello, and they put, put together. And one of the two, I just want to put two famous one by famous example of Venetian painting, one of the first scenes. Uh, the, Lagoon, uh, the 15th century, and what was always enigmatic about it. It's a very faithful, in detail, you can see the Carmarana, you know, the, uh, the bird, the marsh bird here, and the hunting with the north of Venice, and we can see Dolomites that I said before in the background. <coughs> That's what we see today if we go towards the church. Today. Yes. It's quite enigmatic, this orchidea that never grow in the lagoon. And people have been thinking for long where it grows from, it doesn't grow there. So what's some symbolic meaning and other meanings, but actually what happened later, uh, there's another famous painting by Capaccio, the two Venetians, that we need to be analyzed as courtesan, the noble women, two ladies, two Venetian ladies, it is in the Museo Corre. And only by, and you see a little base in the left corner, left, upper left. And what happened actually that this was one page with this originality, which has nothing to do with lagoon hunting, was discovered to be the plot of this fame, another famous painting 
that uh, appeared, that has always been in Mosaic Correo, where this had been a jetty uh, museum and appeared in provenance, it's not quite clear, it appeared in the mid uh, 19th century. But the point uh, I want to make that matching two quite different things <coughs> we know about Venice makes us contribute to the whole, to the vision of the whole. And the recent, and there was a recent quite interesting discovery made by my friend, who's a composer who came just now to visit uh, in the German center of composition with a scholarship. He was just wondering about many and made a very important discovery. He basically discovered looking at the Negroponte uh, painting in the Maltese church, he discovered that this little lunette was not quite in style with the Negroponte. And of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people seeing this painting every day. It's quite, they're very little <coughs> painting by Negroponte. And in the next church, just next to San Francesco della Vigna, there was a very famous painting by Bellini, the baptized. So if you put this lunette on the top of this painting, they, they actually fit. It, was, it made a big news, uh, I made a picture a few weeks ago. This boy was just wondering, he shared this idea with one, one of his friends and the major uh, Italian art critics, Garvey, confirmed that, that this may be the discovery of the new lineage. <laughs> so what, I, uh, what we see is that looking at things, Bonnie around Venice, can still contribute to this obsessive text no matter where we come from the musical side, from the literary side, from the Russian side, from the English-speaking side, it all contributes to the various, to the holistic text that is still to be right. We have at least half an hour of questions. Uh, I'm sure there are many. Uh, may I ask the first? Yes. Uh, so from the quotes uh, that you uh, showed uh, and from the authors of those quotes, it appears that while Venice is a profoundly feminine city, should we say, or perhaps the more feminine it appears to be, the more masculine its representation um, also appears to be across different cultures. So is this a pattern? Is it different in Italian literature? I don't think or so. is this an external uh, point of view? That, that Venice is feminine? That Venice is feminine? Or Venice is masculine? Well, okay, both. Seeing it as feminine does not necessarily mean that it is. Well, one, uh, one reason is purely dramatic. Uh, sure. <laughs> La città, La città Venezia, serenissima. Uh, contributed to the idea is is a she. It is a feminine. It is a feminine city. And of course, in Italian, as you know, from secular work as language shapes uh, the world. Uh, of course, it, it becomes automatic for an Italian that Venice is she rather than he. Okay, but English language writers who do not have the mark. Yes. Yes. yes, of course. It's a still. It is still. It is still a pattern. And even well, uh, when females and there was an I skipped this thing. There's a very interesting female, first female, probably, and first uh, English <coughs> account about Venice. Uh, Fiona Piozzi is the end of 18th century. Very interesting travelogue, where she describes just in her diary how she lives in Venice, how she goes there, she describes there some Marx Square or for instance, she describes how she was not led into um, some Georgian monastery and some people told her you should have changed your clothes to the men clothes <laughs> and then you can go. So it was quite a widespread practice to see the difference of the Carpaccio painting at the time. It was a, uh, but still, of course, and I can even tell from my own experience, one has a kind of personification of Venice 
uh, one is attracted to Venice, but also it is a reflection. There is a lot of broadcasts and a lot of narcissism about the city being a mirror and water. So probably for women, it should be analyzed. But what I remember uh, generally is uh, or even from the letters of Effie, Effie Ruskin, <coughs> Effie Ruskin, Ruskin wife. Uh, yes, women do recognize themselves in Venice while men see an amour there done. Russian. And Tchaikovsky is also quite an interesting 
and I saw he, he didn't like politics at all, he was again, he hated it. And he wrote, uh, I don't remember to come, he wrote that <coughs> it's uh, stinking, it's full of people and crowds, and the only way to get away from it is to put oneself in gondola and order someone to uh, bring you away from it. <laughs> Единственный способ, который мы как точно цитаты, избежать этого, это сесть в гондолу и велеть себя вести. Interesting thing is, 
that uh, his, his book is called The Pursuit of the Hope, and Brodsky ends his novel uh, talking about God being more than a whole. Uh, what about the Russians pursuing Thomas Mann and death and Venice and this point? Uh, yes. That's the first thing I wanted to see, actually. actually yeah, to be yeah, uh, <laughs> 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 you know, the small uh, person, like, yes, of course it is an important. I well, <coughs> can't fit everything else, especially now Thomas Mann, because it became, after Wisconsin, it became more part of the visual and cinematic experience rather than literary experience of the people. Of course, we do read Thomas Mann, but that's in Venice, of course, one hears and one hears Mother, Mother, and one visualizes the lagoon, the moment of commentary to the lagoon. And I, me too, I also, when I came for the first time, I didn't want to come to Venice. I was also convinced it was a very snobbish girl, and I wanted to go to Padre when I believe that Venice is such a common place. And I avoided Venice by going to go to the band, to make a long story short. But the interesting thing is that uh, I never, th of course I s I've seen the movie, uh, but I never thought <coughs> of it as a real place. And it happened, uh, it should be, uh, it, uh, now that I know all the settings and all the places, where, uh, it was a lot, a lot of it was filmed in Lido, but some parts of it was filmed really near Hotel de Bal, which is where Tatsu goes to the beach and all these mm -hmm. uh, famous um, scenes are. <coughs> but the other part was uh, filmed on Alberoni, which is a very remote uh, part of Lido, because that's where Visconti was looking for the special light. And, and then he just to cut and put the two things together. And another interesting thing that when in my, one of my first trip to Venice, I met uh, a man who was a fisherman in the gondolier, and he told me about his father being part of the film. Uh, his father was a musician. He was playing for Visconti in the orchestra. But he said the budget was very low. They asked musicians to appear in some uh, scenes, and his father was asked to be a portier to take the coat of the main <laughs> hero at the, uh, at the arriving at the hotel. So we see a lot of actually now seeing the we have a lot we see a lot of authentic Venetian faces in this film, not part of the crew of the team because of the low budget, <laughs> and wow. most of them are musicians. There are musicians there in the scene and the hotel. They're in the scene, yeah, they're in the scene from the controversist, for instance. And actually, I was so much impressed with his real father, the real person who <laughs> knew his father, the film, yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So when I came back to Moscow, it was the first thing I did, I put the video taken there, and I arrived to the scene to see whether he looks like him, he looked like, just like him. It's a very, it's a very, it's now I will go and start It's now. a little <laughs> It's also almost a documentary of the faces of the time. And then, of course, death, in the film, they call death, and they say dying, Venice, Venice decaying, Venice dying, Venice sinking, is another topic that um, is related to our recent events and to the upper item, and uh, it has a long <coughs> tradition especially especially in Russian in Russian literature and in Russian mentality you know we talk about this it's, like, it's, uh, it's actually a small era in a way and it doesn't mean that the movie is called Death and Venice it's the end of the movie it's the death it's, it's not you know it's not the hero's death which is portrayed and portrayed it's death as the death and, you know it's their too. And it's also deathlessness. Deathlessness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah,
Martin who said, I want to go and die in the best cemetery. Uh, as soon as I have money, I'll go and die in the best cemetery in the world. And a few days later, he decides, he decides Venice. So the idea to go and die in Venice, uh, and there's uh, another small story <coughs> called Dina Rubina, that's called the Soviet Government's Answer. There are a lot of conditions where the main character, she is famous with cancer, and she goes to the Venice to die. So this is a separate long tradition. Uh, and the pound is there too. Huh? Pound is there too, that, right course. next to Brussels. Of course. And pound and pound again. He's also in the cemetery, white, next to what he how much what he painted him or pretended, <laughs> <laughs> or pretended to paint him. Uh, 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 yeah. You just came out. Yeah. And it actually responds so we don't know what I was going to ask, but you could possibly mention it any writing in English or Russian or whatever language you uh, know. Published in the last 20 or so years, it's going to be compatible with their cultural value because you didn't know it. So, my God, there is an answer. Well, there, of course, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of people, <coughs> people write about this every, every, second, every second day. Of course, we cannot, I think we should wait. We cannot avoid it. Uh, we cannot avoid it. But I, uh, yeah, I, like, I quite like writing. Uh, of Vila uh, Rubina, I quite like Vila Rubina. I think it's in this of the way you by um, uh, John Morris, the same the meaning of nowhere, got to yes, and she here has a beautiful book that's called Venice. I think it is quite classic, I would, I would recommend it. it uh, Venice, of course, uh, we can see a film shooting every second day. <coughs> so, um, you know, there is a recent, there was a recent film, The Tourist, with, uh, huh? with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, they just happened to be closed, as we met a few times, and they were a big fuss about um, they filmed the, some scenes uh, in Rialto Market, you know, we went to the market there. Uh, but I don't think it's a great masterpiece, so talking about cinema, I don't know. Now, I quite like talking about cinema. I very much the recent uh, film, it was an Italian, Italian, Andre Segre, I think. Uh, I'm Lee. It's a <coughs> very beautiful, moving story of the contemporary Venice uh, about a Chinese girl, a re refugee, or, or working at Chioggia. And Chioggia is a small fisherman uh, island uh, next, very close to Venice. Mm. And actually, interesting talking about uh, Herzog, it says, Guru Dumu, she's been to a very part of Venice described by Herzen as Georgia. So this, uh, this film is also a um, movie is set in Georgia and she works in the bar and she works in certain conditions and there is a lot of social immigration. Uh, and the title, and she met a local fisherman, with a very beautiful story that I will spoke for you with all the personality. It's both very social and actual and very beautiful and poetic. Uh, and the title of your sonali, it means, in Italian it means I'm there, me is there, but it also it means I'm lead. Uh, another one. So this is, I think it's about six years ago. So I'm going to that. I would, if you happen to see it, watch it, it's one of the best. <coughs> Maybe one more thing. When you show um, <coughs> the upside down yeah, right. text as landscape or as yeah. a yeah. way to navigate landscape, this made me think of 
Michel de Sartois, the famous essay on walking in the city, mm -hmm. uh, which he somehow chooses New York to, to, to be the focal point of it. But uh, the main thing is that he contrasts uh, two seemingly mutually exclusive perspectives onto a city, that of a tourist and that of a passerby or a walker who is unaware of the text he or she is constantly writing just by walking, right? Mm -hmm. So is there Venice being maybe the most touristic site uh, on Earth? Is, it, is there anything that Venice could perhaps contribute to this otherwise interesting but perhaps a little bit reductionist model of uh, looking at the city through the eyes of a tourist or through and the lights, literally, the feet of uh, a local. <coughs> How does Venice negotiate these two perspectives? Well, on one hand, uh, it is true and not true, not quite true for Venice. It's more about, it's not more about what appears, I mean, it's all about what appears straight away in my head. It's more about stopping than about walking. Uh -huh. <laughs> the Venetians, they are quite aware <coughs> that they live. Every Venetian knows the basic things about using their own city and uh, is proud of it and tell you the basic story of the Isle of San Marco, the story of the Lagoon or the San Marco lyrics, more or less, however, ignorant uh, or educated, but basic cultural things are part of the collective conscious. What uh, differs is that we, as Venetians, walk. They walk. They do walk, and they because they have to point A and point B to arrive. To well, what tourists do? They stop all the time. They stop and they create traffic jams. Like we were given as streets being very narrow. I remember, uh, and I do experience my own limitation when I need to uh, take children to musical school. For a, certain, for a certain time, a certain place, and there was a big block of tourists in front of the <laughs> Byron's Palazzo trying to find the entrance to the Lord Byron here or something, or, you know, or looking at some marble statue. Or, uh, so tourists stop and look at things. Venetian, uh, uh, maybe sightseeing, not both sides, but sightseeing things as they pass. Of course, they do recognize the same landmark, but they're part of the inner text. It's like, it's probably like learning to read. Venetians know this text by heart. Tourists is a starter in reading. They stop every syllable and phrase and reread it and come back again. I think it's about something parallel to that, rather than to being unaware of the text. Of course, Venetians are unaware again, because Venetians know the basic things about their own city culture, and here they wouldn't look at it from the English, French, or Russian perspective. That was, uh, I was going to say, of course, Russians, or Venetian, or English, or French people, they contribute to this text by these itineraries. They do, because that's this way they project their cultural luggage on the city map. What do you think of the Yeah, I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention especially, I quite, I do this pride, I quite, well, people, <coughs> it's not people, but it's not girl. I think she's a very clever writer. She does know Venice. She's an important figure in Venice. Uh, she knows what she writes about. So I think she's very decent in her genre. She's a very decent writer, and she's, she Saying about um, how, how 
would you end up to us? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> why do the what, what maybe no, even even more so why do you stay? What is the what is that that calls you there that it's a, a very I just want to come there. <laughs> I know but, but just maybe briefly. Very briefly. I came there <coughs> and I can knew the place where I came to. I mean I started to recognize it from the first sight. It was quite I never experienced anything like that. When I was 19, I, I was forced to do it by my father and friend who worked in for the one of the publishing houses, so in Venice, and she convinced me to come to Venice. And I said, okay, I'll go see San Marco in the thousands, to take a the box in the conference and the Rialto. And what actually happened, I uh, walked out of the station and I knew where to go, what to see, and how to go. And then, you know, maybe it's about recognizing oneself, maybe it's about love affair, maybe it's about... But the more you live there, uh, the more you become attached to it. It's like what Henry James wrote. Did you end up being accepted as a foreigner into the local community or in your local community <coughs> interacting with expats? Well, there are, well there's, no, there's no Russian community that is like that consists of mm -hmm. people and Venice uh, being historically uh, very, well, local. Actually, on one, on one hand, Venice is a very provincial, typical provincial little Italian town. Uh, on the other hand, being Venice, uh, people who come and choose to stay in Venice, no matter where Americans, British people, French or German, it is a special race of people that interact with each other uh, on this basis, a lot of fun. So it's more you know, about choosing for being attracted or having to live there. But also with the locals, with the Italians as well? Of course, of course, of course yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of mixed families, a lot of yeah, and it's a very small town. So, yeah. Really Peggy Yes, <laughs> she is part, she's kind of, I wanted to make this pearl. <laughs> actually, Peggy Vinaret and Linger, whom I mentioned before, she's the kind of musical counterpart of Peggy, the contemporary, what a different relationship. Peggy was Russian's the patroness of the artists and the people in Venice especially after the war, is a separate variant of the 50s uh, in the visual art in Venice. What I always regretted of not being able to live in Venice in the 50s. Uh, really, we have always felt nostalgic when people, especially artists, told me about, not only about Peggy, but visiting each other's art in here and the artistic life in Venice in the 50s is absolutely amazing. So If there are no questions, let's other? No? Well, thank you.